there is a belief system on self-defense and so on that you mentioned, which says that persons' reactions are generally violent. Okay, that's one argument. But I have to tell you that there are empirical psychologists hmm. that say the first response of people is non-violence, non-violence. Okay. Aggression and aggressive response, one has to, in one's life, if one chooses non-violence, because that's a choice. Conflict is everywhere, but choosing non-violence is a choice. So if one is, you know, getting angry or aggressive, because your ego is being, uh, you know, uh, criticized, or you're being criticized, or you're feeling mm, yeah. anger and aggression. The question is whether you can flip, whether you can flip that so that you have a nonviolent response. In other words, in Sanskrit, they'll talk about ugra, ugra, okay. ugra, mm. aggression, mm -hmm. and ugratar you know, more aggression, and ugratam, aggression. And this is aggression as it goes up. Mm -hmm. What? That is, let us say that's like fire. Now, how do you respond nonviolently to fire? Self-defense, right? Do you add fire to that fire? Or do you add a kind of humbleness, which is like water? which is like putting water to fire. Mm -hmm. So the notion of humbleness, mm -hmm. right, uh, is something also deep in the namra. Mm -hmm. in namrata. The, and namrata, namrata, humble, you know, to be humble. Uh, namra, humble, namrata, more humble, nar, namratam, most humble, okay? So when someone is going up in aggression, Instead of bringing ugra, you bring namra into play. And you try to disarm aggression through humbleness, not humility, humbleness. That is to say, you disconnect from aggression and you act out in a non-cooperation style how to be humble. If a sexual overture is being made by a big man and you're a small woman, what you do is you just go humble. Not weak. It's a very big difference. Mm -hmm. You become humble. Yeah. Isn't it a weakness? Humble. Humble. No, it's not. Humility may be closer to a weakness, but humbleness is just you make a joke. You know, you make a joke. You act with a certain humbleness. You disconnect with aggression. And you go more humble as someone goes more aggressive. And you go most humble. And I think this is really something that we teach women in our nonviolent conflict resolution, is if you're going to choose nonviolence, you choose a way to completely be humble, in it, not fearful, hmm. not weak. The weak and the fearful is what fires up aggression. Mm -hmm. you, so it, this is something that comes from culture and I would say generally what people do uh, is they will, so there'll be an aggressive response some, and you'll be humble but the aggression will go up and you'll find it so hard to go down to one more level degree of humbleness that you jump up to aggression. Mm -hmm. This is what requires training. Okay. This is where you need to be trained. In other words, like nonviolent communication, which uh, is very popular in the United States now and has come to many countries of the world. They talk about how uh, you handle things through communication, you know, non-reactive, how you handle anger. I think it's interesting. Anger response is about a 90 second process through the body. If you can hold anger, Mm -hmm. and not respond for 90 seconds, you feel lighter. And what is very interesting is that an aggressive response, if you have something you're really fighting for, you believe in, you know, and you get an angry response, if you interface with an angry response, generally what happens is you forget the issue that you were trying to uphold. You get caught up 
in the anger. So in fact, you lose, especially if you're a woman. You're trying to posit that I'm your equal partner. Aggression comes from often the male side, uh, power over an anger response. And what do women do? They start to get more angry and more aggressive, thinking that's going to win, as opposed to completely deflecting and keeping the focus on the issue on the itself issue. in a very cool and calm way. Mm. Because ultimately that's sustainable. And we can, we can actually jump from this level of aggression and humbleness to social movements, where you have non-violent social movements and social movements that are violent. And what is very interesting is the non-violent ones tends to sustain an issue. The non-violent ones tends to get into uh, deflecting that issue into whether I can be more violent than you. Mm. And so that's why non-violent movements are, by every social scientist will say they're more successful because they sustain mm. an issue whereas the violent one deflects it. into power, I'm more powerful than you, in an aggressive response. So I think there's two levels. I'd first like to talk about how women, in my view, bring into play a kind of a different way of doing conflict resolution. Okay. I think men are more into win-win models, yeah. where yeah. we compromise and we resolve our conflict which really is an abs you know creating the absence of conflict but really is not building peace I mm -hmm. think where women are very just naturally conditioned this way and there are many men who have this feminine quality so I wouldn't say it's exclusive to women but it is a feminine feminine quality of solving conflicts okay and that feminine quality of solving conflicts means that you listen, that you don't have your ego involved, mm -hmm. that you are prepared to uh, spend time on the process and persist, that you're not goal focused. Now, if that kind of conflict resolution is taken seriously by corporate managers, mm -hmm. which I think more yeah, and more are getting right, trained sure. in mindfulness yeah, and yeah, other techniques, yeah, yeah, yeah. then they're going to have a better relationship internally and less pyramidal relationship of my mm. word, you mm. obey. Yeah, yeah, top. Sure. So that's one level. But I think in terms of rules and punitive justice, which you also raised, nonviolence means restorative justice. It's of the belief that if in India, for instance, when someone is guilty, we want to punish them. Yeah. Ah, they're guilty. And in fact, even before hearing the weight of evidence usually is on their guilt, you know, and we believe them to be guilty. And then you have to prove they're innocent, which is very unfortunate. Even for the most heinous crimes, even young people joining the I ISIS, we have to appreciate that they may have taken a decision today, but their decision tomorrow may be very different. And how to see people in a dynamic continuum psychologically mm -hmm. rather than labeling them the aggressor and they have to be punished and then they need capital punishment. I think a much better way of working with people, even people who have been involved in genocide, is to do truth and reconciliation, mm -hmm. is to let people apologize is to let people come forward and see their own failings as opposed to labeling them as the guilty mm -hmm. party. Because what does that do? If a woman is raped yeah, uh, by somebody and her parents want that person immediately killed, that may ex extinguish that particular individual, but it does not transform that relationship. Mm -hmm. What you want to do in a rape case is create a kind of restorative justice so that rape no longer is an issue in your society. That's what you're trying to do, not just kill the rapist, you know, mm -hmm. because that is the difference between punitive justice and restorative mm -hmm. justice. So I think we need to look at 
you know, conflict resolution and bringing justice to a situation non-violently. I would say women have a tendency towards it, should be, but mostly in the home and the community. And what I'm interested is to see how to bring that out in society, those, those abilities for conflict resolution in society.